Hello, my name is Mark Treland. Uh, so uh, this is my second Chippy meeting. Uh, and uh, I saw the call for talks last week, and I thought, well, I just got back from studying typhoons in Japan, and figured I'd give a talk on hurricanes in America. Um, and so I just wrote this up pretty, pretty last minute. I honestly don't really know much at all about Texas or Florida or Harvey or Irma, but I learned what I could. Uh, so, uh, so, um, so I'm going to talk about this uh, package called GeoFlock. So it's, um, uh, and you can do hurricane flooding simulations. Uh, so uh, storm surge is one type of uh, hazard from a hurricane. I'll focus on that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the general picture. Okay, so uh, this year has been a pretty crazy hurricane season for the U.S. Uh, we've got uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, which hit in the end of August. Um, it uh, so it caused about 70 deaths and $70 billion in damages. Um, then Hurricane Irma hit uh, just a couple weeks later. Um, it caused uh, 81 deaths and about $60 billion in damages. Um, and so for a hurricane or a typhoon, so in, just to clarify, so in, in the, east, the West Pacific, they're called typhoons. In the West Atlantic and also the coast of uh, the Mexico, they're called hurricanes. If you're in the Indian Ocean, they're called cyclones. But they're all basically the same thing. Um, there's some different patterns. Um, but any, any of these things is called tropical cyclones. So in a hurricane, there's basically four major hazards. Um, natural hazards. The first is heavy rainfall. So Houston was majorly affected by that. So tremendous rains because the hurricane just, just stops over the Houston area and just pours down rain for a while. Um, the second one is like is really strong winds, especially when you're really close to the center of the hurricane. Um, that can like tear your, the roof off your house. Uh, it can blow debris. It also you know, smash your windows. It can kill people. The um, uh, third thing is, is really relentless waves. Um, so in Hurricane Irma, this picture here, got major erosion of this uh, this coastal beach cliff thing here because the waves are just just, just coming at you and not and that's nothing and that's it's really bad for eroding uh, natural coastlines and also um, concrete barriers um, it's a major problem that coastal engineers have to deal with uh, and the fourth thing is storm surge which is what I'm going to talk about so storm surge is basically um, well let's see uh, I'll address it in a couple talks but it's uh, a couple slides but basically just it's a kind of temporary rise in sea level that can be quite dramatic and quite dangerous. Um, so just like the high, high tide, but a very, very, very high tide um, that comes from the winds blowing water onto the shore. Um, OK, so uh, first thing, let's talk a little bit about hurricanes themselves. Um, so we probably just heard this kind of thing here. You know, every time there's a hurricane approaching in the Atlantic, uh, there's some warnings of maybe you got to be careful in a few days. Um, so how do they actually do this? So um, so it's a pretty big deal. So this image, or I got this, I'll be honest, I took this image from Weather, Weather Underground website. And this, they got this from some group called CFAN. And they got their data from uh, European Forecasting Center. So it's like, everybody is like putting their little finger on it to get an improved model to try to get the best model possible, because it's tough. Uh, right? So this, the, uh, this, this model ran, there were 50 different simulations of this hurricane. Um, and that's a whole piece itself how to model hurricanes. But you can see that you know, we run slightly different initial conditions over here, and they sort of evolve over time, and they have different paths and different intensities. Um, and then you want to guess based on this, what can you, what are you going to, what do you learn from this? And then what do you tell to the community? Um, do you tell people to prepare for evacuation, or stay at home, or what do you want to do? Because evacuation is incredibly expensive and can cause also human, lots of human life as well. Um, so it's a really big deal to call, call it an evacuation. Um, so there's also, uh, so when, this is the uh, Hurricane Irma tracks in August 31st. Um, and then a few days later, they updated this, so the hurricane had moved a little bit further. Uh, basically, the weather forecaster um, discarded the hurricanes that were not, uh, did not look like what the hurricane was actually doing. And they generated a few more that sort of looked more like what the hurricane was doing and projected those further. So you get a better idea of what to expect, but it's still not perfect. You can see here, you know, most of these hurricanes, projected hurricanes are going to the east and avoiding uh, Florida, and then but a few of them are going to the west. Um, right? And as you know, that's actually what ends up happening. So you know, as a couple of days later, so on September 6th, um, they got another updated data. Um, I think every day or two they posted new data. Um, but here you can see it's split down the middle. So basically this red line is going right through uh, Florida there. Um, and so you get a pretty idea that like there, okay, people need to start evacuating or finding 
stay sheltered, um, especially when you start seeing these intensities of wind speeds of you know 150 miles an hour and greater. Okay, so now think a little about storm surge. So storm surge is one you have. So you have a, a hurricane that's blowing really strong, and and the wind and the sea surface are interacting. So the winds are causing larger waves. There's an exchange of momentum here. So these are hurricanes are incredibly powerful, have a ton of kinetic energy, uh, and so they are basically adding kinetic energy, adding motion to the ocean surface, and that generates these sort of large scale waves, um, in addition to the small scale waves that you see. Uh, and this can be quite dramatic, especially when it blows towards an area like a bay. So this is more of a science doc, there's no coda here, but I'll get to some good pictures first. Um, and so it's basically like a mini tsunami. Um, that you've got just this, this rise in sea level, and as this, these large waves approach uh, shoreline, it slows down, it's slowing down, makes it get bigger because a little bit, it's just, it just keeps coming. So kind of like this relentless like onslaught of water that rises, uh, and it could be quite large. Uh, all right, so this is a mass slide. Uh, this is just um, so how we model this in practice is you represent the ocean with like a as just like a sort of two D a two dimensional body of water with with height as a as a variable, and then you can discretize it by breaking it up in little boxes. And then each of these boxes is interacting. They're exchanging momentum, they're exchanging mass, right? So this water is moving in and out, and there's some speed and this kind of things. And at the top of the surface here, you have waves, but you have the wind that's acting as a, uh, that's pushing things here. So it's just conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and we have some forcing terms here. Um, okay, so uh, there's a, there's a uh, some software called GeoClaw um, that can handle this kind of thing. So GeoClaw, it stands for Geophysical Conservation Law, so conservation for conservation of momentum and mass. Uh, it was developed by some academics around the U.S. first to do tsunami calculations, um, and so here's a, an image of of this uh, tsunami of Chile in 2010. Um, and one of the nice features is that sort of the the way that the ocean is discretized can be depends on where it needs to be. So the computational effort of the software is it's low when it's not needed and it's high when it's needed. So it's very it's a, it has an adaptive mesh. That makes things really fast, which is good because these things need uh, a lot of high resolution on the coastlines, but there's a big area. Um, it also be applied to things like uh, dam break problems. Um, there was a was a case in Alaska a few years ago where there's a, a big chunk of ice fell down in like a fjord kind of thing and caused a little sort of tsunami there. And nobody was around, but um, people geologists want to know what kind of things cause this thing. So they did simulations like that. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so now let's talk about some applications. Uh, so, um, so I'll also say here about GeoClaw, uh, it's, uh, so it's a combination of Python and Fortran. So it's mostly Fortran. Uh, Python is mostly just kind of a wrapper to set up the data file, the configuration files. Uh, it's, nice, it's nice and easy to, you know, to edit what you want out of the simulation. Uh, it basically, the biggest practice it uses NumPy and MathPub. Um, but the bulk of it is done in Fortran, which uh, is actually pretty actively used in this entity. Um, okay, uh, so, all right, so here's the data set. So I wanted to figure out, can I apply this model to Hurricane Harvey? Uh, so I'd used Geocloud before for some typhoons in the Western Pacific, uh, and I wanted to see, like, okay, can in a few days, can I figure out how to make this work for this chat Um And so, uh, so I set up the spatial domain. Um, so here's just a picture of Hurricane Harvey. So it's the hurricane itself is like something like four or five hundred miles in, di in diameter. It's pretty huge. The storm tracks are like hundreds of thousands of miles. So you need a pretty big domain, um, computational domain for this thing. Um, so here it's about three hundred thousand by two hundred thousand kilometers. But then the grid says is you need like along the coastline. You're not talking thousands of kilometers scale. You're talking like tens of kilometers or kilometers. You want like you want to know what your neighborhood is going to be facing. So you need to have really small resolution on the coastline. That's a big problem. Um, uh, and okay, but that being said, um, so again, you can pretty easily download the uh, topography and bathymetry data for this kind of set. Um, the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, uh, has a nice, a nice uh, API for downloading <laughs> this bathymetry stuff. So there's probably expert GIS people here that you could uh, ask about that. Um, but it's pretty easy. And then the hurricane data, uh, so. The National Hurricane Center publishes what's called a best track record for all hurricanes that are passed through, um, and that's just a it's a parametric thing. So it just shows like how and how with the strongest winds, how big is it, 
uh, just like a few parameters along along the track here and where it's located. Um, and then from that, it can be converted through like a simplified model um, that looks like a kind of a hurricane spiral. Um, okay, uh, so now I'll show uh, the output of GeoCloud. So I can it's, I configured the GeoCloud thing here. You can see the code I posted it to. Um, but if I run it, uh, let's see if this will work here. Okay, so let's loop that here. And okay, so here what you're seeing here, okay, the, you can see the geography here is right, the, the Gulf here, Caribbean. Um, the color scale here is pretty hard to see what's going on. This sort of red dot is just the eye of the hurricane. The the color is the sea surface deviation, right? So how how high the storm surge is. Um, and so this is over a scale of like maybe five days. You can see it kind of just hovers over here. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of kind of red activity going on over here. Um, so I'll zoom in on that. Um, I just want to give you an idea of the scale here. Um, OK, so if we go, let's just zoom right in. Well, that's the next of that. Um, so yeah, so if you call when you run it, it just generates this kind of nice HTML thing here. So you've got all these, you get all the individual images, and then you get it gives you an animation you can do right away. Um, Okay, so here you can see it's doing something. Right, you can see a little bit more data, the more resolution here. So there's there's a bay here that's getting a lot of storm surge, uh, and then the storm surge definitely is not so much. So one thing I also when I prepared this talk is I had no idea what the storm surge was going to be in these hurricanes. I just hoped that it'd be interesting because uh, there's not always storm surge in these storms. And sometimes it's pretty weird, as you'll see for Irma. Um, okay, so this is a zoom in on uh, uh, what. Well, again, my geography of Texas is failing, but there's a bay here. So yeah, you can see for like a second, you go through and like, <coughs> so I'm just pause it and go back there. Take a look. <coughs> so you can see that it's the, the sort of the resolution is changing as it, as it progresses, uh, and that helps it be a really fast computation. So this takes about 10 minutes on my laptop to run. Uh, whereas like similar kind of computations can take need super um, and there's some trade-offs in terms of accuracy, but, um, but so here you can see that you get about uh, two meters storm surge height. So I'm 1.8 meters. So you can see, imagine the storm <laughs> sea level rising as high as me in a matter of a couple hours. Um, and then also behind this sort of ridge here, you have a decrease by about two meters of the sea level. So you have a lot of activity going on in this area. Uh, and then I just want to show just the sort of the maximum levels here. Um, so in this area. Um, so here you can see like, the maximum change of the sea surface. Uh, so you get about you know, just under two meters of storm surge. Okay, so this is kind of a simple application. Just the hurricane comes right in, causes some storm surge, and then wipes out. Um, uh, for Irma, it's a little more complicated. Um, so Irma had a weird thing where, so you can see from this, the shape of this, the, the typhoon, that there's a there's spiral going on here. So if you're just north of this, of this eye of the hurricane, the winds are blowing. It's right hand rule. Right hand rule, yeah. So yeah. they're going to the west. If you're just south of the eye, they're going to the east. Right? And so that actually has an impact on the surge. So it's going it's to change the direction of the current. The current will be moving westward, just north of it, and eastward to, uh, below it. So this is what happened in Tampa. Um, so in Tampa, the, the storm track, just before Tampa, it went inland. And so Tampa got the west moving winds. And so that, that pushed the water away from the shoreline. And so they had a major drop in sea level near the shoreline. And people were coming out taking pictures and stuff. Meanwhile, the hurricane center was saying, get out of the shoreline. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it, you know, it could come back pretty quickly. Uh, and it, it didn't actually, the was pretty much spared. It was spared a lot of uh, potential damage um, because of the slowness of coming back. Um, we had this, you know, manatee was, was, was stranded here, but I think was, I think was able to get safely back in the water. And it all <laughs> But anyway, so you can see that the, the, the track is, a, is it's really, really sensitive. Um, so we have all those, you know, you're running 50 different hurricane simulations, and you got to tell people, is it going to be safe or not? In this case, for Tampa, it ended up being fine, but you know, a few other projected hurricanes might have not been fine. Um, it's incredibly sensitive. Uh, that's why you need a fast model to figure out it 50 times. Um, okay, so now we'll look at the actual areas that were affected by the surge. Um, so this is from the Washington Post. Um, so there is a big sort of uh, Floodlands National Preserve here that was that was projected uh, to get a lot of storm surge, um, and also this area of Fort Myers here, Naples, Marco Island got pretty hard hit, hard hit, Cujo uh, Key got pretty hard hit. Um, so we'll see if Geoblock can, can 
match this kind of picture here. Um, uh, all right, so let's see. All right, so I'm gonna run, okay, you know what that looks like? Well, let's run this here. So I'll show the animation here of just the storm track moving through Florida. So you can see little little bits of color happening here. Um, and one thing that is makes me happy is that there's a sort of this negative, uh, negative storm surge that's happening north of the, the storm eye and a positive surge happening below it, right? As water's moving either away from the Florida coast or towards it. Um, that would be really happy to see. It just worked out of the box. Uh, and then now we'll look at the zoom up of uh, the south part of Florida and the Keys. Uh, and let's run it here and then I'll slow it down a bit. As you can see here, that uh, the resolution is changing, um, but you can see the keys pop up here as the storm approaches, and then the simulation says, "Oh, we got to resolve this more closely." Um, so the keys got hit, uh, and then if I go forward, you can see there's sort of the, the negative surge happening here, and as the storm moves north of it, it turns into a positive surge. Right? So the water is moving into that uh, those, that natural uh, natural reserve here, um, and then further north, you see the negative surge in Tampa. Um, and I'll just show it at the bottom here, showing the maximum levels. So here we're getting in this, this area, I think for the, the population, if you know we live there, it's a designated flood zone, um, was three meters of surge. So it's 10 feet of, of surge in that area. Um, and so that was a major thing, uh, major, major hazard for people. Uh, I think winds are actually more important in this storm, but can you read us? Uh, okay, so I'll end with that. that. So storm surge is a major hazard for hurricanes. Um, Jupa is a cool, low-cost tool that you can just run the simulation on your laptop and get an idea of you know, something you need because open source science is really fun. Um, and so if you want any info, uh, here's the, the Clawback and GeoClaw are on their open source, They're relatively easy to install. Um, I think you can install it with PIP too, which, but I haven't used that yet. Um, and uh, I've got some source code for everything I've made for this talk on the website um, and I'm happy to give more information. So thanks so much.